Well, hello, this is Alex Reed. Happy Halloween. It is October 31st, uh, 2022, and I've got a thing in my hair. Oh my God, can I get the thing out of my hair? I don't know if I can. I'm going to have to just do this video all over again. There we go. I got it. Okay, good. Uh, let's do this. Um, Halloween, right? It's one day a year. Um, this year, uh, it's funny. It's kind of in like, I was just talking to my class. I'm teaching this course on the Gothic, and right now it's a Monday. And Halloween this year thus had unofficial celebrations on Friday and Saturday and Sunday. And I said, geez, is anybody a little bit like Halloweened out already? And a few of them were raising their hands. And that, by some logic, is an intentional thing that culture or um, some larger metacultural mechanic is actually after. Here's what I mean by this. Let's say that you're a strict parent and you don't allow your kids to eat sugar. And you're like, oh, they'll they'll get fat or they'll have uh, high dental bills, they'll need fillings. But the real fear is moral decay, right? The real fear is that you will spoil the child. Somehow the child will be actually ruined by eating too many Snickers bars um, and that they'll only want more sugar and they'll be addicted and that they'll start doing all sorts of terrible other things, right? They will just become, you know, uh, wasteoids. And, uh, and so then you say, fine, one night a year, you get to eat all the candy you want. And I know that there are some parents who are like, no, you can only have two pieces on Halloween. But like, imagine that you're one of the types of parents that's like, no, no, fine, eat the whole bag, eat a pound, eat 50 Snickers bars, go wild, right? To the point where your kid feels actually sick, right? Where the hangover occurs and the promise of decadence is delivered. That is to say, the morning after, right? That's the definition of decadence, is so much pleasure that there is retribution um, implied, if not explicit. So, um, sorry, my hair keeps getting in my mouth. Anyhow, um, once your kid does that, um, they don't want candy again, at least not for another week or two, and possibly not for another 364 days, right? In this way, Halloween acts as a pressure valve. It releases culturally built up pressure to um, misbehave, or in other ways, simply to not follow the strictures that govern us 364 days a year. And therefore, you can think about Halloween as like a time when you get to do stuff that is otherwise not permitted. I'm thinking here of the 1785 poem by Robbie Burns, right? The great Scottish poet Robert Burns. Um, and in this poem, it's called Halloween, and he's describing in beautiful Scots dialect the rituals of this little rural town in northern Scotland. And he's got footnotes throughout the whole thing, and the footnotes explain that these rituals, which, for example, involve kids walking into a field and ripping a stalk of kale out of the ground um, and then hanging it above the door, all these rituals are relentlessly about the same thing, which is to say who your future husband or wife will be or whether you will enter into marriage um, a maiden or, uh, or, or a, degraded, uh, a degraded fallen um, woman or man or what have you. Um, and uh, these are rituals for people who are young, um, maybe, like he talks about people being, you know, 14, 15 in this poem. Um, and this is important. Like when you think about these rituals of like, who are you going to marry one day? I get thinking about like cootie catchers, right? Those little paper things that kids in like second grade would tell each other's fortunes with. Or the game where you'd spin the globe saying like, oh, you were born in Pakistan. You were going to get married in Australia. Ah, uh, your husband or wife will be from Canada and you will retire in Venezuela, whatever it's going to be, right? Um, all these things are little safety valves. They are pressure valves that allow young people, in these cases, to lay claim to sexual feelings, right? To say, ooh, I'm thinking about marriage. I'm thinking about um, the titillating idea that one day I will get to be an adult and I'll get to, you know, have a boyfriend or a girlfriend or something like that. Um, and these are feelings which, again, 364 days of the year um, are impolite or uncouth or uncomfortable to talk about. And so, um, and so there's this, you know, time when you get to sort of joke about them and, um, what do kids want? You know, what do, what do the sort of pre-adolescent kids want for whom, you know, marriage and sexuality is just not on the horizon? Well, they want candy, right? They want sugar. They want just sweetness. And so that is the five-year-old, the six-year-old, the seven-year-old id. Whereas, you know, the 15-year-old id is like, ah, tell me more about, you know, the weird stuff, the sex stuff, whatever. It's all good. So this then is this day that allows for all this stuff. And when we think about what else is permitted 
on Halloween, um, all sorts of things come into view, like knocking on strangers' doors, right? How many times have you been, have you been told, don't talk to strangers when you were a kid? And so on Halloween, you get to talk to strangers. And that's wild. Um, you get to violate the social contract. You get to go knock on the door of the big fancy rich people's house that you normally aren't allowed to go near. That's cool. Um, and for that matter, if you are an adult who lives in a house, you now have to be ready to open up your door um, to randos just knocking on your door and kids. And you have to be friendly because if you don't, you are now violating the one day a year social contract that says you have to be nice and give them candy, right? So even if you're stingy or even if you are um, very, very Christian and not, you know, uh, buying into this whole pagan business of Halloween, you still have to give out candy. You still have to play the game. And so, um, yeah, it's a new social contract. So we're changing that. You get to dress up, if you're a trick-or-treater, in a new kind of outfit. And that means that you don't have to be yourself. That means that you can relinquish um, what it's like to carry around the burden of being yourself. I mean, like, do you ever get tired of being you? I get tired of being me semi-regularly, right? So it feels, you know, kind of exciting to be like, great, I'm going to be Batman for a day. That's exciting. Or, you know, maybe your um, fantasy or the pressure that's building up in your personal pipes um, is not about being Superman or Batman, but it's about um, being a different gender. And you get to do that, right? You dress up in drag on Halloween, nobody bats an eye. You now get to do this. You get to just be the thing that you, you know, wanted to try being. So it's a safety valve, it's an experiment, um, and it's socially sanctioned. Again, just this one day a year, so that's great. Um, what else do you get to do? People behave badly, right? Trick or treat, right? The origin of the tricking, um, there are a few sort of contested origins. Some people say that it comes from, like, blessing people. But some people say that it just comes from, like, um, the idea of uh, punishing those who don't participate in this one little, you know, give candy one day a year contract. And um, if we think about things that build up in that pressure valve, not only might we have, like, desires to be Batman or to be a man or a woman or something else that we otherwise don't get to be, but, like... Not 100% of the human internal experience is charitable, good things, right? You ever have a day where you're like, well, I was not very proud of those emotions. Let's say you have road rage, right? Let's say you're like, I'm driving and this person in front of me just kept me from going under this light because they slowed down when it turned yellow and I'm so mad. And you think like, gosh, I just want to like do something awful, right? I want to crash this car, right? Or, uh, you know, when you, when you want to reply to your boss's email with a great big picture of yourself doing a middle finger, you don't do that, right? At least most of us don't, right? Those of us who do that are punished for it, sanctioned for it. But when we think about things like Devil's Night, where people throw toilet paper at each other's houses, and like the tricks can take the form of like, ah, I ring your doorbell and I run away and ha 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 ha, there was nobody there. Or ah, you thought I was the young boy next door, but actually I am a cowboy, you know, to see my costume. But also historically they can take the form of like arson, right? I mean, like you read about 1900 in New Jersey and you get these packs of teenage boys who are like, you know, um, doing horrible things. They're like, you know, stealing horses and running them over cliffs. And you're like, geez, that's terrible. But, um... Even when these things get bad, the night is still functioning, illicitly or otherwise, as like the one night of the year when you're so-called allowed to do these things, or at least kind of expected to do these things, right? So um, it's, again, this kind of safety valve. And um, I think that's important because it's a temporal calendar-based modeling of what uh, scholars of the Gothic and what like old school Freudians refer to as the return of the repressed, right? Such that when you tamp something down and say, no, 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 this one thing is not allowed, right? Then it's going to come back and it's going to bite you. And um, this manifests in a million ways. It could manifest in the form of like a monster. Think of a sea monster that arises from the deep. Ah, we thought that the Kraken was a thing of the past, but no, it's coming up, it's rising again. Or for that matter, um, uh, a werewolf, right? You control the animal within, in this case, with a werewolf, not 364 days a year, but actually like 29 days a month, right? One day a month when it's the full moon, you're like, Arrrr! the animal comes out. Or uh, a zombie, right? A zombie is the dead returning, right? The return of the repressed. We bury the dead maybe out of respect, but also to put them away so that they won't come back, right? 
we put things under the ground or in basements or in attics or under the rug or in closets when we don't want others to think about them and when we don't ourselves want to think about them. But um, when we closet ourselves, whether we're talking about like sexuality or whether we're talking about skeletons in the closet, these things have a habit of like re-emerging. Ooh, right? So um, Halloween then is like a scheduled, sanctioned return of the repressed. And we do this almost like a good luck charm. You ever go to a wedding where, and they do this at like, I think some Jewish weddings, where they'll stamp on a glass and they'll break the glass. Um, one of the things that that does is it is something getting broken. It's something going wrong preemptively so that when the really important thing comes along, the wedding and the marriage that follows, the thing that could go wrong has already gone wrong. You've already opened up the pressure valve. You've let off that steam of something going wrong, right? The other shoe has preemptively already dropped right? Something is already bad, so therefore, whew, we're in the clear, right? So it's like a good luck charm for something to go wrong, right? That's wild. Um, anyhow, uh, the last thing that I'll mention is that on, uh, on Halloween, of course, the form that all these things take, whether we're talking about pulling a stalk of kale from the ground and saying, oh, this looks like your future groom or bride is going to look, or whether it's, um, you know, carving pumpkins, which originate with this myth of you know, like uh, someone who, 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 who tricks the devil and then is uh, denied entrance both to hell and heaven. And so the devil is like, well, uh, I can't send you to hell, but here, I'm going to give you a token um, to help you out. This is a turnip that you can put a candle in, and that's the origin of the jack-o'-lantern. Anyhow, um, whether it's that uh, or whatever, these are like fundamentally pagan rituals, right? Dressing up as ghosts, scaring away the demons, the notion of this being the day of the year when the veil between life and death is that it's, is at its thinnest. Um, there's no nativizing these ideas. They're all fundamentally pagan, right? And yeah, some Christian folks are like, no, 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 we can, we can shoehorn this into Christianity. More often, at least in America, people are like, okay, fine, go have your weird, crazy pagan fun for one night. But also, you can see for people for whom spirituality is a really, really important matter in which one slip up could mean the end of it all, right? 24-7 spiritual warfare, you must be constantly on guard. I can understand why people are like, no, 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 my child will not celebrate Halloween. This is the devil's birthday, right? So no, you know, say uh, the Seventh-day Adventists or whatever it's going to be. Um, but what this means then is that um, it's a release from, you know, these sort of spiritual assumptions. And if you want to take it um, as more than just that, it's a release from hegemony. It's a release from normality. Um, and it's a recognition that before the normal, right, before Scotland was uh, colonized by uh, successively uh, the Romans, the English, the Saxons, the Normans or whatever, that there existed, and by the way, I'm speaking metaphorically here, right? This is not all about Celtic North stuff, um, but that there existed always, wherever you are, something older, something before, and something um, fundamentally like pre-logical, pre-rational, something magical. And this is, you know, paying a little bit of tribute, paying a little bit of um, sacrifice of your, uh, of your time and of your psychic energy um, toward those magical um, possibilities. Because even if you are 99% certain in your rational atheism that you know that there's no magic in the world, or if you're 99% certain in your doctrinaire Christianity that there is no, you know, weird spirits to be, you know, uh, reckoned with and that all we have is what is above and maybe what's below, right? 99% <laughs> is not 100%. And none of us actually knows what happens after we die, right? We can be 99% sure. But there's always just that last little like, yeah, but what if you're wrong? What if you're wrong about everything? Where's that other shoe, right? And so, um, and so it's really, really important. That's like a fundamental structure of the Gothic, right? It's that last bit that cannot be nativized. And it's the fact that like, if there's a little hole in, um, I don't know, if there's a crack in the castle wall, or if there's maybe another room behind that wall, how far down does that room go? You don't know what's in there. There could be anything. The color black, the favorite color of goths. Black doesn't just hide the known. It's not just the known unknown, but black has in it the potential for the unknown unknown, right? That 1% could be the door to much more than 1%. 
dark matter, 99% of the universe. Weird stuff, right? A portal, a door, a secret passageway, um, a little box that you find in your attic that opens up and you're like, oh, what's this? It's just a little box. There certainly aren't going to be Cenobites in it or something like that. Anyhow, like the point being that like um, the one bit of the unknown is fundamentally untamable. The one part of Robert Mapplethorpe's photography project that cannot be put into the Metropolitan Museum of Art happily and tamely. Not the nice flowers. Not the portraits of, you know, upstanding um, individuals. Oh, there's a squirrel behind me. Uh, but like the actual just like anal pornography that people are like, ooh, yeah, yeah, I can't give my money to that, right? Um, the 1% of what if, um, the gnarly bit, the fact that the three witches in Macbeth, when Macbeth says, what are you doing? They say, a thing without a name, a deed without a name. That 1% of things that's unnameable, that we don't have words for, or that our words fail to express. So that's why I like Halloween. I actually can take or leave costumes. I'm not really into costumes. I'm not dressed up as anything. But I'm fascinated with that one little hole in hegemony. The one line of flight to get Deleuzian about this. Um, the one bit that can't be explained by the books. You know, the 1% chance that, uh, that the Bastille could be stormed or that the election could turn out differently than you think, or that you'll wake up tomorrow and the sun won't rise, because there's no law that says it has to. It just has, in the past, before done that. The fact that you could one day, you know, um, wake up a different person, Oliver Sacks style, and say, ooh, <laughs> right? The fact that, um, you know, there could be something more out there. That's, to me, what Halloween has going for it. Okay, I'm going to go inside and do something probably very weird. Good night.